So these are quite changeable times we're living in. They're quite exciting times. They're quite scary times. I'm a digital learning tech Technologists, so I, I, I live in the space between what's possible with tech in a slightly utopian era way and what's pragmatic and real and how it can really influence learning. And I, I sort of move between these two, these two positions. Um, and I, I'm particularly fascinated about seeing how rapidly technology is evolving, AI, new kind of tools, how, how rapidly the world feels like it's changing around us, um, climate climate. Uh, crisis, refugee population movements, um, new kinds of work, fourth industrial revolution. So this this whole idea of, of a sort of AI powered, machine learning powered jobs disappearing. So there's a flurry of, of things going on right now. And this is a sort of very uncertain future. If I'm planning right now for my kids and trying to understand what kind of jobs they'll be doing or how I can really prepare them for that future. So I sit in between those two spaces. I'm enthusiastic about tech and some of the, the, the doors that it's opening. I'm, I'm worried that learning itself and, and that the, the schools and the institution of learning are, are so slow to adapt and so slow to catch up. So let's think about some of the, some of the wonders of, of, of digital. The one is open access, um, free access to really meaningful information, Wikipedia, open educational resources, academic publications. Um, YouTube's, TED Talks, a flurry of access to um, experts um, in giving, sharing freely of their knowledge. I'm from South Africa. Um, we have a real problem in rural schools of really poor access to information and knowledge and text, even textbooks. But with a digital connection, suddenly this huge world of, of, of information is available to learners. So this, this open access is massively empowering. It's not learning, it's information, and obviously that, that it takes a, a teacher or it takes a richer process to turn that into learning, but really powerful. Another powerful thing of digital is scale. So um, I, I'm in the ed tech area, um, get a small group, 10 people of inspired techno ed people together, they can build some perfect future learning app. And that's all it takes. Those 10 people, they can get it right. It'll distribute across the world. Millions and millions of learners could potentially benefit from that. So that's, again, the wonder of digital and the scale, the fact that if you get something right, millions of people can be impacted on it. So these are the good things. Obviously, there's a lot of difficult parts, too, and fake news and things spreading wildly. But the, our, our, our mission as, as educators, and particularly the tech-centric educators, is to try and cherry pick those good bits and weave them in constructively so that our, our learners are better prepared for the future that's coming. So why doesn't this happen right now? Uh, when I speak to, to head teachers and ministries of education and people involved in the education space, it feels a little bit like a Mexican standoff. You know, one of these cowboy movies where you have three or four people all pointing the gun at each other and, and nobody's moving because nobody wants to pull the trigger and nobody actually wants to shoot the other one. So, so it feels a little bit like that situation. So you have a school saying, oh yeah, I'd really like to, to be more bold and innovative, but you know, our school is, is compared with the other schools based on our grades and our grades are locked into this particular assessment and the assessment is locked into this particular curriculum and the curriculum is locked into sort of how all the other schools are progressing. And so there's this, all these stakeholders, whether, whether they're the publishers or the teachers or the ministries who, who accidentally are throwing in their part of the constraints. And when you multiply all the constraints up, actually it makes it very, very hard to innovate at all. Which means that when you see digital things happening in the classroom, they tend to be replicating what was happening pre-digital. They, they tend to be um, sometimes jokingly called paper behind glass, but it's, it's taking what was happening in the class and just doing it a little bit faster, or, or maybe the mark, it's auto-marking homework, but it's still giving homework in a kind of similar way. And what you're not seeing so much is the wildly new things where, where it's some new kind of creativity is happening that's spanning multiple subjects and maybe is initial projects that take several weeks. It, it's very rare where you see these, these, these more transformational, constructivist type of learning happen. And, and my, my call would be to try and help schools do that. It does happen, but it happens outside school. So here's a number, 20 million, 20 million. So last year, 20 million students logged on to one of these MOOCs, these open university, open free, free learning platforms, to sign up to do a course. That's massive. 20 million students did that. Now, and it's free learning, and they're from all over the world. 
Now, the thing with MOOCs is of those 20 million, maybe only 1 million actually made it through their courses. There tends to be quite a big drop off. But still, that's a great intent. All right, another number for 20 million. In the last two weeks, 20 million uh, people logged on to Twitch, which is a video streaming site where you watch other people playing games, video games, and you learn from them how to play that game. So that's 20 million in two weeks. And the average amount of time they spent, an hour and a half. So that way outstrips the MOOC story. This is learning happening right now. These are probably learners in your own classroom who are going home in the evening and not doing their home homework and spending an hour and a half watching somebody else play a game so that they can learn how to play the game better, right? Digital learning is happening right now. It's just kind of being excluded from the classroom. So my call would be to really help education feel much bolder about looking at the edges where the innovation is happening and trying to understand how to bring some of that in rather than waiting for it to radiate down in the, in the classic kind of waterfall way that, that these things have done in the past. My second bit of advice would be use tech to do stuff. Don't be a consumer. So a lot of, a lot of learning platforms uh, um, or, or educational systems are, are a big system. They, you, you sign up, it, it recommends things, it does your homework, it does the whole piece, and, and you, you become a, a, a Con you, you become a sort of consumer. You, you, it's like Netflix and just watching the videos. So I, I, I watch Netflix, it's great. I watch the videos, it's great. But I'm fairly passive in this experience. Where I really love seeing tech being used um, is in rooms like I am right now, which is full of cameras and tools and people building things and making stuff, um, Arduinos, chips, building robotic arms. This is a powerful use of tech, and you're not constrained by this big system. You can collect bits of fragments together to build and create. And I think that's really what's helping us produce kids for the future. Both my children, have one's just left high school, one's just left university. They've both got their first jobs in the last week. Both of their jobs are things that didn't exist before. And in both cases, it's about training robots, in, in effect. It's about training drones to understand what they're looking at when they fly. And, these are jobs that generally didn't exist. But if you have a bit of a maker mentality and you're prepared to try and help work with unwieldy tech and teach you to do things, I would argue that that's a much better preparation for the future than just being a solid consumer. And um, I guess my third, my third point um, would be about using tech to help you master your own weaknesses. So um, uh, I, I work at a language learning app. And in that, in that instance, people subscribe with us because they want to learn. But then life gets in the way and they get too busy and they forget to learn. They don't come back or they start enthusiastically and then they get distracted or they run out of steam. And one of the, one of, one of the, the things that we feel honor bound to do is to help them get over that early hump, help them engage, help them build a bit of a healthy habit. The web's full of bad habits, right? It's full of social things that drag you in, clickbait, stuff that tries to make you spend more time on a website, more time in an app. Social media is, is very powerful at this. And part of our, our mission is to try and understand some of those drivers, some of the behavioral nudges that drive that behavior, and try and pivot it for good, to try and take those behaviors and use it for learning, use it to help you engage with a learning topic. So if you do have free time, rather master some more vocabulary in Spanish than, than, than just click through somebody else's feed a bit more time and feel bad about the holiday you're not on. So, so I guess the third point is to really see tech as an enabler, but try and turn it for good or learn enough of the skills that we can, we can use it for good instead of just being this more passive consumer and, and being trapped in somebody else's um, um, drive for our time, our attention economy.